artists and designers. So Stamps Gallery is an incubator and lab for contemporary artists and designers to explore ideas and projects that catalyze social change. As the pandemic gripped our nation, it laid bare the, bare the deep roots of racial health disparities and violence that continues to disenfranchise and dehumanize communities of color and LGBTQ plus people. The staff at Stamps Gallery drew inspiration from the courageous act of one high school student, Darnella Frazier, that changed the world. We applaud Frazier's fearlessness as she not only recorded the painful murder of George Floyd in, in, the, in the hands of the police, she shared it on Facebook for the world to witness the injustice. For me, it became clear that Stamps Gallery must offer multiple inclusive opportunities for students, for listening to students' voices and learning from each other to cultivate an ecology of care through our exhibitions and programs. In this spirit, we launched Respond, Resist, Rethink, an open call exhibition for students from Stamps to design posters and make videos to respond and contemplate what each of us can do to build a stronger community together. One that is based on values of racial equality, justice, and belonging. How can we acknowledge our own biases, learn from each other, listen to the voices, and listen to the voices of those who have been silenced? The goals of this exhibition are multi-pronged. So one, to highlight the voices, ideas, and questions from students at STAMPS, so the student body at large at STAMPS, regarding the extreme challenges stemming from the, from the pandemic and grappling with the impact of systemic racism and violence as it impacts each of us and our, and our, and our immediate communities. To build a stronger community at STAMPS and beyond. To formalize STAMPS Gallery's discursive approach in building our exhibitions and programs where we consult with various stakeholders and that include staff, uh, faculty, students, and the general public to inform the emphasis of our programs before they take shape. For this exhibition, I, I must thank, and I'm very grateful uh, to our wonderful colleagues who really, who we consulted deeply um, as we developed, um, as we conceptualized the show. Um, and they are uh, Professor Marinetta Porter, are um, Brian Banks, Romy Hill Cronin, Veronica Fal Faldino, Professor Frank Nuno Quarco, and our RACM intern, Madalena uh, uh, Aquilina. Madeline Aquilina, I'm so sorry, Madeline. Um, and the third um, objective of this, of this exhibition is to offer ongoing and diverse opportunities for STAMP students to learn, explore, and expand their capacities. So following the wonderful response we have received from faculty, staff, staff and students, as we were conceptualizing this exhibition, we have decided to make this an ongoing program. This means that we will kick off every academic year and our fall season of exhibitions and programs with a STAMPS student exhibition. So after this panel discussion, please stay tuned um, as we will be soliciting your thoughts and feedback about the exhibition and how, what, how we can make, you know, um, uh, you know, and how we can uh, make it stronger as we move forward. Um, a, an integral part of this exhibition is its selection committee, uh, which is composed of students, faculty, and staff. And this year, a selection committee consisted of Nicholas Doug Willow, Elois Janssen, Kisa V. Johnson, Frank Nuno Quarko, N.D. Puskovic, and Destiny Riley. And of course, the Stamps Gallery staff, um, Jennifer Jankumayer Khan, our Rackham intern who worked with us all summer, Madeline Aquilina, and myself. So a, a sincere thanks to each of you for your generosity and rigor as we reviewed the work. So last but not the least, I want to thank all of you wonderful students who have applied for this exhibition. 
I hope you will continue participating in the student exhibitions and initiatives that Stamps Gallery has to offer. And I look forward to hearing from you, uh, please, throughout the year. Um, so please feel free to reach out, reach out to me by email or whichever, uh, whichever way. Um, so now without further ado, I'm excited to turn it back to Jennifer, who will be introducing our wonderful moderator and, and we will hear from these from the students. Thank you. Great. Okay, cool. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, so before we move on to the artist presentations, I want to give you a quick rundown of the event and go over some housekeeping. Um, following opening remarks, we will be sharing images of all the artwork in the exhibition. There are 20 artists included in the exhibition and 11 artists, I believe 11 artists might be a little bit less. I don't know if everyone uh, came who told me they would, um, but 11 artists uh, we have with us today who will be telling us about their work in 280 characters or less. Once the participant, participating artists have wrapped up, I will introduce our moderator of the event, Eriberto Eddie Palacio III. Eddie will lead a conversation with the artists and take questions from attendees. Um, if you do have questions, please feel Please feel free to add them um, to the chat. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the event. Um, so you can post questions at any time, but we won't be taking any until um, towards the end of the event. Um, so before we start looking at the images from the show, I just wanted to speak very briefly about the 280 characters or less artwork description that we asked students to create for this event. 280 characters is the maximum number of characters that can be included in a tweet on Twitter which is what the 280 characters used here references. 280 characters was the only limitation given to the artist. Their characters could take the form of a poem, be one word in length, be a list of words, or be a more traditional artwork description. This gesture is meant as both an exercise and critique of the tweet as a now commonplace mo modality of communication, an intervention meant to toy with and subvert its newly appointed function as a megaphone for the state. It asks us to consider what happens when this form is used to describe an artwork. What are its limits and what are its possibilities? Okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Okay, so first I just wanted to tell you a little bit, I wanted to go through the artists who aren't here and show you their work. So we have Soyeon Lim, William Miser, Adriana Alakala, Maggie McConnell, Natalia Rockefeller, David Corsi, Ray Jung, Casey Ruald, and Judah Pemple. So next we're going to let, um, I'm going to turn it over to each of the artists to speak. So for if there were any artists who weren't able to join us a, a little bit before the event, um, I just wanted to let you know that when you see your slide pop up, and we have a slide for each of you, when you see your slide pop up, if you want to unmute yourself, um, uh, introduce yourself and then uh, and speak your 280 characters, that would be excellent. So I'm now going to um, turn it over to the artists. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ellie Schmidt. Um, I am a first year MFA student and I'll just go ahead and read my blurb. Um, this bedsheet poster designed for visibility was carried around the streets of Nantucket, Massachusetts as a reminder of the many we have lost to racism. Thanks. Don't know if Emily was able to join us. And Emily, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, oh, here. oh, good. Oh, excellent, Emily. Go, go uh, for it. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, just to preface this, I'm not an author. And when I was reading this, I was also sorry. Writing this, I was also reading Pride and Prejudice, so it sounds a little different. Um, so racial literacy is a moving target so let us be perfectly willing to follow it this target moves daily don't fall behind let's recognize respect and not choose to be blind okay 
Hi, I'm Makayla Thomas, and I'm a second year. By remaining open to the various identities people hold, we can create strong relationships and more inclusive supporting and a more inclusive and supporting society. It's fundamental for change, and the bonds created through helping one another can last a lifetime. Accountability. Why are the per capita number of Black students admitted to U of M so low? We perpetuate racism when we do not speak against when we do not speak against systemic racism and inequalities in our own communications. We must eliminate oppression in all forms. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nathan Byrne, and I'm a second year uh, MFA candidate in the Stamps School of Art and Design. Um, collapse and supports the between cut right the making, making the right cut between the supports and collapse. Collapse and supports the between cut right the making, making the right cut between the supports and collapse. Collapse and supports the between cut right the making, making the right cut between the supports and collapse. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eloise Jansen, a senior at Stamps studying art and design and anthropology. Um, creating a diverse environment calls for equity and space for everyone. The ocean holds one of the largest and most diverse ecosystems on earth. We need to follow suit and create a system where all people are respected and have a space to exist to become stronger together. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elijah Thompson. Um, you'll never break me, you'll never bend me. You'll never mask the immutable moxie, perpetual permanence, or dauntless dynamism that echoes in every step forward. What is your cabal of contemporary kings to our pantheon of perennial providence? Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jenna Sheen. I'm a senior at Stamps. Um, is the Black Lives Matter movement disturbing you? Do you wish your social media feeds would go back to normal? Maybe it's time to reconsider why injustice was normal to you in the first place. Hi, I'm Molly. I'm a senior at Stamps. Um, I'm celebrating the once offensive caricature of yellow and reimagining Asian people's relationship with it. Fetishization has been defined by others rather than the subject of the treatment. By using self-portraits, the subject reclaims control of how they choose to be seen. Everyone, I'm Ben Winans. I'm a MFA, second year MFA student here at Stamps. X, former, out of, a union built on blank canvas, a union in surrender, a union supported by whiteness. The American flag is a symbol. What can we learn if it is altered? What can it bring out? How can it help us reimagine its future? What can it show us about its past? Thanks. 
Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Wow, that was um, even more powerful than I thought it was going to be. Okay, so next up um, is kind of part two of uh, our event today, and I'm going to introduce our um, moderator, Eddie. Heriberto Eddie Palacio III is a multidisciplinary artist that explores human relations and awareness through research that investigates social constructs, masculinity, gender studies, emotional intelligence, and African American studies. His, his exploratory studio work consists of different mediums that prioritizes the audience's interpretation of context over the aesthetic of medium specificity. This allows him the freedom to create without emphasis on the medium as a catalyst for his ideas. He investigates how to relate to society through the use of pop culture motifs while still contemplating the relationship between commercial art to academic art and how that affects the delivery of his work to his audience. Palacio has a BFA from Tennessee State University in Nashville and an MFA in Visual Arts from Watkins College of Art in Nashville. Along with his full-time art practice, Eddie serves as an admissions counselor at the Stamp School of Art and Design. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome Heriberto Eddie Palacio III. Hello everyone and good afternoon. It is my pleasure to be the moderator for today's discussion, not only as the admissions counselor at the Stamp School of Art and Design, but also as a professional visual artist, African American male and member of the LGBTQ plus community. I would like to take a moment to thank Outreach and Public Engagement Coordinator Jennifer for her gracious invitation to collaborate with the Stamps Gallery on this event. And I would like to thank the selection committee who selected the works presented in this exhibition. I would also like to give kudos to the student artists who demonstrated their solidarity, strength, and critical thinking by creating work that is socially engaging amidst a global pandemic, social unrest, and personal challenges faced through virtual learning amongst other displaced aspects of undergraduate life. And finally, thank you to our audience for joining us today. Before we get started with questions and discussion, I would also like to acknowledge that this is that this subject matter is rather sensitive and can be triggering, especially during our social uh, social climate. I want to reassure all of you participating today that this is a safe space for expression and learning. We are here to engage in honest and critical discussions, and it is important to face those social count uh, the social challenges that come with that. I also would like to invite the audience to populate questions in the chat for our panelists as we move through this discussion and we can try to get to your questions uh, uh, and uh, we can try to get to your questions towards the end uh, here today. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, I, I, I would like this to be more of a discursive discussion. Uh, I, this is less more question answer from uh, the artists and um, I just again thank you uh, for joining us here today. So, um, I would like to um, start by posing a question that is going to make you talk about your work, but also talk about some things around your work. So a question I'm posing to the panel uh, today. Um, this exhibition includes work that can be read differently depending on the viewer's own race, engagements in society, and upbringing. As artists, our work can sometimes be adversely received by our audience. I would like to pose a question to the artist of the exhibition. What are you risking with the work you've presented in this exhibition? So I can hop in just quickly on this question. Um, so my piece is sort of like this poster that was designed to be hung on like a public building outside. And um, I was in sort of this insular, very white town where um, when my family and I, we took the poster into town, we had to sort of approach these different store owners and um, ask them, you know, like, can we hang the sign on your business? and just personally as a not very confrontational person, it sort of forced me to engage with people about these issues um, at this very turbulent time. And so I think it was important for me to sort of cross the threshold from like an abstract activism into just sort of engaging with people, um, everyday people on the street. And so it was pretty challenging, but um, 
really important experience. And so I think what I was standing to lose is sort of my like comfort. <laughs> um, yeah. Guys, thank you for sharing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if anyone was going to talk, they can go. That's okay. You can go first. All right. Um, so for me, my piece, when I really think about it, there was no risks aside from like, all right. So let me, let me frame in terms of like why I made the piece. Um, I kind of just wanted to pull a bit away from like the more tragic glo like gloomy like realistic aspect i guess and like focus more on um the potential for like grace and power and like just courage that people of color have and communities of people of color have um so for me really the only risks in making that piece was alienation from those that don't see that as a quality in our communities so i don't really even see that as a risk to be honest, but yeah. I, I think that, that it's important to note too that um, you're, you're also choosing to show a different perspective of, of some of these issues. Because you know, when you think about these topics, the first thing we think about is how to fight and engage that injustice head on in a more, uh, almost in a conflict type of setting or debate setting. And to take that and to shift it into um, you know, uh, I don't want to say playful, but to, to, to take it from a different perspective that isn't so uh, stoic and serious and constantly causing conflict, more so discussing more things around it. And I think that that's important too. So thank you. Okay, so what, uh, what I made my piece is that I kind of felt like I risked being like seen negatively because at Stamps, it's quite obvious that there is it, the the, pop, the Michigan population does not reflect inside the school, and I, I think it is quite obvious when you look at the statistics there, but it could have been seen as not enough has been done, and the system is is quite biased on who they choose to attend stamps. So I thought it could have like it, it could have not be seen as good when um, being made, I mean, because it, it's pretty, it's, I think it's like calling out like what is being done currently with the current selection process at Stamps. I think that's a really interesting point, especially I feel like we've all been talking about this power of assertion. If you're able to put your actual stance out, that is a power and to not withdraw into yourself when you know there's an injustice being done to actually stand in that is immensely powerful. And especially when it becomes on a physical level of actually, like Ellie said, bringing something around with you and walking around and showing that you have solidarity with it physically or in a cognitive um, space of an imagined space that you create something and assert it out. As long as you're asserting it, I think that's an immensely, sometimes life threatening. And it may just be a life where you were withdrawn and you let go of that life, but you step into a new life. Yeah, and I, I, I love that as well. We're, we're talking about what, what does it mean to be an ally? What does it mean to, um, to speak um, not only with people, but to speak uh, from your perspective and uh, to talk about how maybe your perspective isn't something that you necessarily think is right. It's just something that is it's real. It's very real. It's a, it, we're all different people experiencing different um, lives together. And I think uh, every, every voice is important to the discussion. Um, and I, I think that, that it's, really, uh, it's really important to note that everyone is coming at this from a different perspective. Even though it is the same subject, we're all still going to have different um, feelings and approaches to it. And I think that that's important to note. So yeah, thank you guys so much. Did anyone else have anything before I uh, move on to another question? Sure, I can say something. Um, so I think for me, uh, it's difficult as a white artist to talk about, um, to talk specifically about black culture. And so trying to navigate these waters with a, a certain sense of um, 
of delicacy that that is required. Um, so my piece, the risk of my piece is that symbols are so easily recognizable and, and the flag is such an easily recognizable symbol. So and then you also translate that onto a, a graphic poster that's meant to be read and understood quickly. Um, the risk then is how to portray it as sort of a, um, a more nuanced conversation so that people can come to it and read things out of it and, uh, and eventually take away some sort of an understanding or some problem that they have to solve afterwards. Yeah, uh, so that, I think that that's also, that also brings us to another thought of how um, sometimes our, our work isn't going to be subtle or isn't, it, it can be very um, triggering or startling. And sometimes that startling is necessary, um, even from different perspectives. So it, it's really interesting to think about that. And um, I think that actually leads me to my next question uh, for the group. Um, so uh, BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, is an acronym that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. How do you think being bi BIPOC and or a minority versus white and vice versa affects the execution and delivery of your work in this exhibition? I can definitely say for me, being a BIPOC person, it's okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it just impacted my style of rendition as well as my perception of reality, I could say, as being a person in high connectivity to the land as a living, breathing entity and feeling destroyed in some aspects because of the pure destruction that takes place in our current time. Um, my art always has represented that in some form. And this piece is actually allowing a sort of historical voice to that the people of the land, enslaved people in this country who built this land up from, you know, when it was the new frontier and now it's the biggest industrial capitalist country in the world. But that all came from the land and that all came from people who worked the land. Exactly. I think that that um, it's important to not only just acknowledge that, but to be very specific in uh, and I appreciate your specificity, you know, there, there's no mixing or uh, of words or vagueness about it. It's the uh, straight to the factual uh, details of it. And I think that that's important to describe and elaborate on too. Yeah, um, I was going to say that uh, when I was considering entering this exhibition, I was also thinking very carefully about my um, identity, you know, like as a white person and the, the place that I grew up and the beliefs that I subconsciously absorbed throughout the years. Um, and I wondered over and over again if I was qualified to be having any opinion on this subject at all. But um, I sort of thought like, who, who's the audience that I ought to be talking to, you know? Um, and I figured it, you know, I can't speak for people of color in, in any circumstance, I can't. But um, to speak to people who have to overcome various uh, myths and like harmful beliefs that perpetuate harm towards people of color was sort of my goal. Um, so that, yeah, I had to be careful. I felt that I didn't, um, you know, I didn't try to say something that wasn't, you know, make a point that wasn't mine to say or something like that. It's, <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah, thank you. I think that it's also, uh, that, that also urges us to think about how uh, the different audiences that are collected around this subject. So, you know, you have the audience in which you uh, can address the, the, the audience that is considered, um, I hesitate to say victim, but the affected audience, the audience that is receiving negative impact from uh, these injustices. But then you also, uh, it also makes us think about the other audiences, the audience that is uh, uh, in some form perpetuating that impact or aiding in that perpetuation of the impact or just an audience that is not uh, being affected directly. So there needs probably to be a different engagement and conversation around that. And those discussions are important too. Um, and, and, and then, you know, there's this idea that you don't want to uh, lecture the affected group, but then you also don't want to coddle the group that is 
uh, possibly perpetuating that um, that negative impact as well. So I think that it's it's really great to hear how uh, uh, each of you are thinking about different ways in which you were engaging with the audiences, uh, the multiple audiences that gather underneath the subject. So, yeah. Would anyone else like to uh, say something? I do think it's really interesting you mentioned working working with audiences because when it comes to concepts like racial violence or discrimination in any form, it all comes down to a warring faction of perceptions and perceptivity. And that's really important in art, which I think is a really good form to challenge perception, especially in the dimensional forms that art can take and the multi-layer, multi-dimensional um, aspects of it. So it's very, it's very important to, you know, think about that perception and whatever, you know, even in a sonic form or a visual form, how does that work with audiences? And I, I really like audio because I feel it deeply affects people regardless of where they stand. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that uh, be, uh, because when uh, your, your audio did uh, give a different type of consideration to what we were understanding about your work um, versus, you know, just hearing a verbal affirmation or dialogue around the subject, how audio can uh, become a different uh, playing field of perception for even people that are experiencing similar uh, uh, experiences and perceptions as well, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Cool, and I don't I don't want to move too fast either because I know uh, some of these questions might you know give us a chance to ponder or like react and things like that. All right, so um, I uh, this this actually uh, builds into my next question, which I think is going to uh, broaden the the frame uh, of the same type of question that I just asked, but uh, basically. The University of Michigan itself has been dil diligent about implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives throughout our Wolverine community, but it is still a predominantly white institution. So uh, to being students of this institution, how do you feel that affects the, uh, not only how you're making your work and how you're uh, displaying your work, but um just just how is that being received from an outside audience because yes within the university of michigan community there's one type of receivability from it but um uh, i think a prime example as um an alumnus of an hbcu uh, a show like this probably would be framed in a different context be presented in a different context so i'm curious to uh, uh, as artists uh, what are your thoughts on like how that has affected the presentation of your work and the receivability of your work outside of the University of Michigan. Go. Yes. Can I go? It's all good. No one else going. I hate to talk over someone. So I was I for like how other because uh, it's not just a problem of University of Michigan. Other prestigious colleges have this problem too, where they're very much about activism, but they really don't reflect activism in their choice of like students and they're even if they say they have other reasons, there's still institutional racism too, with like families being uh, like like poor or like um, there's less funding for public schools in certain areas. And it's still like, it kind of like goes up all the way. And I think colleges could go like the extra mile and try and improve, like kind of help break the system because I, I know, um, I know affirmative action is controversial, but I feel like there needs to be more, like there needs to be more push. Otherwise, a lot of the activism is hypocritical in colleges. I feel like a lot of the art, but it, cause like colleges still reflect a lot of like institutional racism, even though we know colleges are very liberal. And I feel like that could be represented more in action rather than words. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for that. It, it it really does lead lead us to this discussion again about um, um, just like how I think the the topic of our dis our, our discussion is leading to this this idea of like perspective of of not only just the artist's perspective but the perspective of the viewer but now uh when the frame gets broader uh such as if i'm an outside entity viewing this work i'm looking at this as these are university of michigan students that already is setting a framework of the institution in which uh you're, you're attending and and possibly that affects how your perspective on the subject matter is whether um, whether you're BIPOC, whether you're white, a minority, etc. Um, so I think that that that's super important to think about too here as we uh, just as we're moving forward in our social justice uh, initiatives and art making as well. Yeah, I think if you have people who are critiquing your work that are racist, they're automatically not going to see the work for what it truly represents, and that's what. I, I encounter at this um, institution is a lot of people who like in practice there's a lot of talk of diversity and action and inclusion and I know there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes but when it comes to some instances of art especially being as subjective as it is there can be a sort of mix into an anti um, kind of anti black it's just pure anti-black like it becomes sort of um framed around one conception of art that is hyper focused on realistic forms when in reality realistic forms are only a fraction of what the entirety of art can encompass so if you have a person who has a very limited spectrum of perception the entirety is lost and that's just the frustration of being an artist anywhere but when it comes to institutional art especially being an, an academic person and not being able to be received in the faction that, you know, I mean, it just is disappointing. Yeah, and I, I, I think I, I love that you're, um, you're very much being open and transparent about that, that feeling and that, that idea of like, also, maybe sometimes the reason why my perspective isn't heard is because we're afraid to show it. We're afraid to present that at an institution that could lead to some unfortunate eye openings as far as like, we know that it's possibly there. We know that there's a possibility that there are uh, possibly fellow students who might have a, a disagreeing idea about social justice and social justice art. Um, so I think that it, it, it's really imperative to, to acknowledge that uh, fear or potential uh, backlash and possibly why the, the framework of how we're presenting our work can be discouraged almost. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. <clears throat> I've got a quick thing. Um, so in an academic setting, um, especially at the graduate level. Um, uh, here I am in my thesis year, you know, um, in, a, in a graduate program and everything needs to be focused on our thesis research and our methodologies around, uh, you know, <clears throat> the what's going to be like, what's going to represent us as uh, for our experience here. And, <clears throat> and sometimes that leads to misunderstandings about people as a whole, because, um, for instance, like issue social justice issues and, um, and like, a, and things like that, even if it's not the key component of someone's research, that could still be something that that person cares about. And so I found this exhibition to be a great opportunity to <clears throat> engage in something um, that might not be part of my core research uh, for, for, for my time here as an MFA uh, student, but it doesn't mean that uh, I'm blind to these issues like social injustice, inequity, and um, um, disparity, and um, you know, th and structural injustice. Uh, so, I, I was very grateful to be able to do a project and um, and do something a little bit outside of the box as as far as how people might um, consider. Uh, 
my, you know, um, the, the core of my research. Um, and so, so doing things like this and then, um, and then quietly uh, engaging with the community in other ways uh, is just, it, it makes me feel whole as a person and not that I have to, because a lot of uh, what we do is we pigeonhole ourselves into these little boxes that, and, and everything has to match up with our research. And, and, and sometimes you have to go outside that box and make a statement as an artist or engage in something that might not be part of your core research, but it's about something you care about. So we just have to realize that we are human and sometimes we have to operate outside of the structures that are mandated uh, to us uh, to, um, to communicate through art, you know, and uh, so anyway, so it was nice to do something outside the box and uh, I'm grateful, so. Yes, uh, thank you for that, uh, Nathan. I think it's also uh, uh, just, I, I, I think I'm noticing something too, and uh, this ties back to Anika's uh, response as well as yours, Nathan, that there is, you know, uh, we, we were just talking with Anika about how uh, microaggressions, there, there, it goes beyond just this blatant, like, uh, racist or, 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 um, or angry response to social injustice art, uh, but also the microaggressions, the small things, these small things around the larger problem that also feed and perpetuate this problem. But then Nathan, I think it's, it's interesting to hear how you're talking about micro progressions, uh, where, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to focus and change your entire, uh, you know, thesis or thoughts to be socially injust injustice, in uh, engaged in social injustice conversation. And if you did, that's great. But the, what are the little things can, that uh, I can do as an artist to really just uh, to, to help perpetuate good things, to help alleviate some of that pressure, especially from um, this idea that the community affected is a community that has to do the work to not be affected anymore. What are they going to do? But that I think that these micro progressions can fight these micro aggressions. And I think that, that uh, th those, that's a really important juncture that I would like to acknowledge, which uh, leads me into one of, uh, uh, I I'll say my last question. Of course, I have more questions uh, based on your responses. But my last larger question for the group uh, is uh, what is our responsibility as artists when engaging in social just injustice art making or social art making? Um, and so what I'm asking with this question to elaborate a little bit more is uh, what responsibility do we have uh, to our art practice in, in two social injustices, uh, such as social activism, activism art? Uh, you, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of talk about how artists, we either fall into this design, you know, high art aesthetic or we fall into the social activism aesthetic or honestly into the marketing aesthetic. So like th th those are just the three realms I'm identifying. There's of course more and smaller ones, but how, what responsibility do you feel as artists uh, do we have to uh, social activism and social art making? Um, I, in my opinion, I think at least when I go and try to create anything that invokes a social or a response related to social justice. I just want to say something that means, like that has a meaning and makes a meaningful contribution while also saying it in my voice. Um, I don't want to try to like cut like weird like pieces and cut my style or my voice or my point into this weird like shape to fit a square peg in a round hole. Um, it's not like, I don't know, it just needs to feel natural in a way. And that's like making a meaningful contribution and being true to myself are my only responsibilities. And that's freeing, but it's also um, difficult at times. Yeah, jumping off of that point, um, I do think it is the artist's job to tell their personal story. So it's not my job to take on the perspective of someone who is BIPOC and tell their story. It's my job to tell my story and my perspective through my personal lens and not necessarily um, making work that sets out to change the world, but making work that sets out to change myself. And by making those efforts, if you are learning about 
U.S. history, making that extra effort to learn about the people's history of the U.S. and not just what you're being fed from a textbook and learning stuff outside of the standard and outside of the traditional canon of art history and learning about how art was used as a means of protest and how like printmaking is like an underlying basis for like resistance and like since it was created. And I think it is just like the artist's job to take, learn as much as we can, capture the world and just show people the beauties and injustices that are in it. And I think beyond that, it's kind of the public's job to do what they will from what we're telling them. But I do think it is like just telling our story, I think is a really big part of it and being true to ourselves. Yeah, going off of uh, what Ellie and I just said, definitely authenticity is like the key ingredient to making activism art and um, really like saying your message is you really need to have like, or like being authentic and having our, our creative voice and like a message that we're very passionate about. I feel like that's like where we all started. Like that's definitely square one. Um, what I've learned like this summer and, and like um, just like in my approach or my like journey to making art with powerful messages is that like creativity is a weapon. And I mean, we all uh, use it for good or we all try to. So really understanding the power of creativity and how we can use it to um, tell our stories and make our messages heard. And also the messages of people that we understand and people that maybe cannot speak up for themselves. Um, not as a, a, like a speaking over voice, but as a, yeah, as a weapon to help other people, I think is like a big part of making art. Um, with, with social justice. Thank you. Uh, that, I, th I think it also opens up this idea that we, um, w as artists, uh, we're not only just being empathetic, but then we're also approaching it from um, an academic standpoint where we, we're not just uh, stewing in our empathy, but we're also taking that empathy and then using our, our our skill set as artists and our critical thinking as artists to implement that into the larger society because uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people can't find the right words, the right visuals, but as artists and critical thinkers that uh, we're engaging with other things outside of ourselves, all the things around our art practice. And I think that that was really reflective about uh, how we operate as artists. Um, when, we when we focus on a subject, we don't start by focusing on that subject. We start by focusing on the things around it and begin to gradually draw ourselves towards the center of that. And I think that that's uh, an important thing about uh, social activism art is that it's talking about all these small things around it, these microaggressions that lead us to the main point of the aggression. And I think that that is something that uh, all of you as artists are doing with your different conversations around your work that all have different perceptions. They're all combating and facing different things, maybe similar things, but at the end, they're all leading to that central point. So it's that discursive conversation around that subject that's really important. Did, did anyone else have anything? Um, I've been kind of thinking recently about the responsibility of artists to sort of understand the space that you're taking up in a gallery or a show or um, any sort of creative space and sort of create more of like, a, I think Shimmer, you used the phrase like an ecosystem of care. It's like everything is connected. And I think the more that artists, the more that we can try to connect to other people and sort of lift each other up and create more of like a connected community um, where one person taking up space doesn't need to shove other people out. I think is something to strive for um, in this context. And yeah, just to like navigate the systems of privilege and when you're showing your art somewhere or, um, yeah, so just something to think about, I think is sort of trying to understand space. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, that answer too, because it, it, it also makes us think about how we're not just discussing are uh, we're not just uh, uh, 
facing conflict head on, supposedly, we're also inviting conversation. We're trying to uh, initiate and spark those discussions that are, you, you know, taboo discussions of, am I being racist? Have I ever uh, performed any microaggressions? Have I ever censored myself? Um, and, you know, just, uh, just giving primes examples of that, uh, changing how we're talking, how we're walking, uh, those, those code switching things that uh, uh, BIPOC people might have had to do in different spaces, but also uh, speaking about that perspective from a, a, a white perspective as well. Like what, what are the things that uh, uh, people are doing to uh, moderate their behavior instead of actually engaging in honest discussion without, of course, being offensive and rude. There, there's a difference between, you know, uh, shouting racial slurs at someone because that's what you think the answer is versus sitting down and saying, I just really believe in this thing. And how do we discuss that? And how do we uh, civilly engage with that? And I think that that's what uh, we, the goal is to have, not only have these discussions, but get to the root of, of what we're talking about. Because, you know, a lot of it is just layered upon so many things. And um, I, I think as artists, we, we peel away those layers little by little with the, uh, the work we do. Yes, that's very, very like important. Really, I feel like this delineating theme of just innovation of space, we have to step out. Like Elijah said, I can't put the, put the um, square peg into the round hole. So I'm gonna go over here and do work on this. Maybe it's a different avenue and maybe it's an uncomfortable space. Maybe it's an uncomfortable setting, uncomfortable conversation that we have to have and open up. But it all starts when we actually assert that as in an innovation of that time space of us changing something that otherwise was gonna to continue to be stagnant with our work. Precisely, yes. Thank you. And also, um, did uh, I, I know we're uh, probably very deep in discussion right now and uh, everyone's probably engaged, but did anyone in the audience have any questions they would like to ask the panelists? I don't wanna feel like I'm running the show too much. <laughs> and uh, I, I feel this is a welcoming space to where uh, if you want to unmute and ask your question, feel free. Um, and you know, you know, I even wanna turn it on the artist. Uh, do you guys have any questions for each other uh, or anything you want to talk about as a group while we're here today? I actually um, wanted to go back to what you were talking about with um, different like routes of design. You were talking about like design or art uh, in activism and also design in activism and how those play different roles and how um, the designer or artist um, makes change in those different avenues. I just wanted to hear like how you, you or like your guys' thoughts on like what those avenues look like and like how those um, exist in an activist space. Because hmm. I, I will I, like to elaborate like coming from kind of more of a design background like I'm definitely like in a design track more than an art track so I am not usually in the studio and I don't have like an exhibition or a studio, yeah, a studio um, like coming up or anything. It's not my goal, but definitely like creating art. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess it just, they, they both have very different um, like responsibilities and routes of like speaking messages, so. Um, for me personally, as an artist, um, I do a lot of storytelling. That's how I got into art and like visual art is just sort of a vehicle for my words. Um, that's just sort of why I started. But for me personally, like as a storyteller, you kind of like help to contribute and shape culture. And I think that most visual arts illustration, graphic art, they all tell a story in some way. So you're shaping culture in whatever contribution you're making, whether it's big or small. Um, so I think that, like I said earlier, making meaningful contributions and making contributions that aren't excluding people, aren't putting things down, aren't like, like unjustly at least, um, aren't just like shaping the culture in a way that doesn't benefit a an efficient move forward and a uh, sustainable movement forward. I, 
I think that's your main responsibility. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for, uh, uh, thank you for your question. And of course, thank you guys for your answers. So we actually have some questions here in the chat. Um, so I'm going to start first with, uh, we have a question from Juliana. And this is actually a question I have too, as uh, the admissions counselor here at Stamps. Um, do, uh, do our artists have thoughts on how to make the Stamps admissions process more equitable? Uh, this is a very difficult topic just because there's lots of factors to think of like fairness and not like tilting the scales too much. But I, I think currently that there is, is more focus on some factors that favor uh, students with more income or from a certain area with better schools. And like maybe more programs or stuff can help students who are in lower income areas with like less uh, privileged schools to help get into stamps more. It is a very complicated topic though. And there's lots of things to consider with that, but that is just my take on it. Yeah, sorry, I wanted to respond. I don't know if you all hear the siren outside, but- oh, there's, a, there's a siren outside mine too. Oh, okay, well, um, what I was gonna say is uh, sort of similar to what you said that um, it, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on how money flows to the university or what the university is capable of doing or what they are allowed to do. But the idea of the university, um, you know, going to underfunded school districts in Michigan or maybe outside of Michigan, um, you know, maybe in Detroit or in other areas and, uh, you know, donating money or supplies or having teachers spend time there or having students spend time there. I'm pretty certain there are engagement courses at Stamps that do similar things to that. And maybe more courses like those could, um, could help people, um, could help like younger kids in like elementary schools, middle schools or high schools in Michigan feel, um, you know, like getting into a school like this is not impossible regardless of the, the financial hurdles and all of the other hurdles. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a big you know big complicated problem, and I'm sure if there was an easy solution, we would have it. Um, but I think an idea like that would be would be a positive thing. Um, from what I remember about the admissions process, like the portfolio, um, I think it was about ten pieces, right? Um, I know I I was fortunate enough to go to a portfolio review. I actually met Juliana. Um, and I um, like I was able to get people or to get like other art teachers to like look at my portfolio and tell me that I need more like mixed media, I need diversity in my portfolio, and I need to work on some stuff and do some more studies. Um, so that was really helpful, and that definitely like was an, a resource for me to get a leg up and have a competitive portfolio for admissions. Um, I I don't like. The portfolio reviews are also not everywhere. Like I'm not from Michigan, so I had to like travel a pretty long distance to go to a portfolio review. Um, so that was something I had to like go out and seek and like spend money on. And, and also like um, the advice that I got was that I needed more of a diverse like medium in my portfolio. So I like, I had to go get more materials and stuff. So like having, just a couple like pencil sketches or like just a couple pen sketches like or like simple I, I don't know cheap material um produced portfolio pieces weren't gonna cut it or that's what I was told so having like online open source resources where students could get advice on what a good portfolio should look like would be really helpful or like remote portfolio reviews um I don't know if that exists already but um, yeah, and also consideration that materials and like diversity and variation of materials are not always easy to come by. Um, I'm not an artist in the show, but I'd like to answer the question also. Um, going off of what Emily said um, about communities that are underfunded, I think as a person who went to a school in Detroit and who is from Detroit, I think that something that could happen to make this the stamps admission process more equitable 
would be to provide representation for these students because I know when I wanted to apply to different art schools, I know that the the um, representatives that the University of Michigan specifically brought were pretty unwelcoming to me when I had any questions about art related topics. Like, I mean, like the artist even scoffed, like the person even scoffed at me when I asked that. So I think that having somebody who looks like the students of the community that you're that you're wanting to bring into the school, sending them to those schools really helps to encourage students to attend and also having more positive people coming if you do not have people to represent. Awesome, thank, thank you guys so much for your, uh, your answers and uh, thank you Juliana for that question. Um, and so scrolling back up here to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Uh, so our next question is from Jennifer. I have a question for Lakaila. Where did some of the images in your work come from? And are, are they your own photographs or are they more, is there a more specific source? Well, for the hands, I used my own hands and used sign language for the actual symbols that they're representing to kind of get across this message that if we set aside our differences and look at the value of a person for who they are, we can really help one another and support one another. And for the fabric, I took pictures of fabric that I had, and then I used websites that provide free stock images and then edited them and collaged them together to create a background because we meet a lot of people throughout our lives and that gets woven into our personal history and I kind of wanted to contribute that in. And a large part of like, the meaning behind my piece is from something W.E.B. Du Bois um, said in Our Spiritual Strivings, which is the power of a single black man flash here and there like falling stars and die sometimes before the world has rightly gauged their brightness. And that was just something that was really impactful to me and made me think, like, if we look past the surface, there's so much more to a person and we should really help one another and support one another. Thank you for that. Um, and so our next question here in the chat, um, also from Jennifer. So this question is for Anika. Could you tell us more about the juxtaposition of Harriet Tubman and the Sears logo in your poster? What are some of the other images and icons you are juxtaposing? Yes, definitely. So um, the background photo that's sort of in the um, under layer of the Sears store is uh, this, I remember from my childhood always seeing these images of enslaved people in the cotton fields, like multiple images that I used to copy and draw just because they were so pungent to me like they were so potent and when i saw the words for one someday when i saw sears i was just thinking of like a seer and sort of having that soothsayer concept juxtaposed or sort of delineated with harriet tubman who was a soothsayer in the form of here's the truth it's frank it's brutal it's harsh but this reality is if you want to come with me then come with me and i saw the sort of um connection between the cotton which was the currency of that era and the same it's sort of evolution into the capitalistic superstore which a plantation is a capitalistic superstore just from a different from the antebellum era and so i wanted to have all of these different images come together to really create what my mind sees as all the same sort of point in space time, which never actually got to be together, but truly sort of are together. And I think juxtaposition juxtap juxtap and collage are the best. Coll I've always loved collage because it's, you can put all these different things together and then the composition comes together and you force these things to have a relationship that otherwise wouldn't have been seen because it was not plausible within the frame of time. But art can do that, art can exceed that. Mm. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That was a, that was a great explanation. I'm, I'm not even going to try to back it up a word. So our, our next question is for uh, uh, Elijah. Could you tell us more about the background in your poster? Are they important to the themes in your poster? 
Um, so originally I just started out with the words that were in the poster and kind of like formed images around them. Um, so the backgrounds weren't planned originally, but after I had finished the images and set them up, I realized that it looked really bland. And I also realized that this is an entire space that I could be using to like kind of cement the message of the poster. Um, so realistically, at least to me, the, um, the ones that matter the most are the first and last one. Um, the first one got cut off a little bit, but it just says, um, fuck your pipeline. Um, and it's a Native American um, woman. But the last one is more so just a juxtaposition of like the power in the message behind all of the pain. Like it's, it has as many initials as I could fit on that one banner of um, minorities who have been killed. Um, it has just constant messages, things that have to do with um, assault on women, um, assault on trans women, um, things that have to do with like, I don't know, just existential messages that gravitate more towards the central um, point of the poster. So I would say yes and no, they are important, um, but yeah. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and so our next question uh, is from Ray. Um, what should be considered or what should be, be uh, should be the better methodology when artists or designers work with or for the community which the artists aren't uh, represent for the community well? Um, and forgive me, Ray, if I'm uh, misunderstanding your question, but I, I, I think what you're asking is, um, how, what are artists and designers uh, who work with the community? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry for my background noise and my unstable internet access, um, but it's about um, sometimes um, the artists have commission work for the working with the community and they are not representing the community itself and they are outsider and they just like um, making some work and then leaving. And in that case, what should be considered when artists um, make some work with the community members? So it's more what's more methodology and like pre thoughts for that making. Thank you. Uh, okay, I can I can start by answering that question. I think um, I have had experiences or or like class experiences where we've had like a community partner or something to design for where um, we weren't we weren't in the community that we were designing for. And it in a in the class setting that I've had like in the past, a lot of it is or I mean we do a lot of research, and I mean a lot of research is very important, but it's definitely not enough. Um, I've had experiences where, where professors have only relied on research and we actually haven't spoken to the community that much. And that is hard to do in a class setting when the community is like not like right next door or anything, but um, it, it should definitely be uh, as collaborative as possible with the community. Even if you're just, if you're talking to, even if you're, if, I mean, it would be great to talk to artists and designers in the community that you're designing for because they definitely have a better perspective that is easily translatable into your work. But like as talking to the community and involving them as much as possible in the creative process is really important. Even if um, it's just like telling them exactly what you're doing and them being like, okay, yeah, that's good, sure. Or like that I'm not really, or if they appreciate it and they can identify things that are, um, that they they like or they don't like, um, like that's way, way more effective than just doing a lot of research on the community. I think whenever it's possible, whenever it's a possibility, um, the actual inhabitants or the actual like earth, or the actual area should be as closely involved in the construction of art in its area as possible. And even if that means possibly giving community members access to tools to create their own mural, and there's like a creative director who's supervising and can provide counsel and direction for these people who are definitely already very creative people 
in any place you go, people like are going to be creative, they're going to be adaptive. And that's, you know, even on a physical level that translates very well into art, they just have to, people just have to see that they can actually achieve something to that highest level of actually, let's say like a big, a huge monument or something or like a painting on a the side of a building, they just need like, to know that that could actually happen for them and then have the tools to do that would be really cool to see. I totally agree. It's like about designing and making art with rather than for. It's like the biggest thing to remember. Hmm. Yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, that answer. It also reminds me of, um, uh, I just wanted to mention a project, uh, Project Row Houses, if you ever heard of it. I think it's in uh, Houston where the artist um, literally was engaging with the community and asking them what their needs were instead of just telling them based off of research what what their needs are uh, based off of you know paper and what and what have you but actually engaging with the community directly and saying what is what what are the problems you have what are what is something that I can think about critically and solve for for you as a community and what are some uh, ways I can net, pull networks together to make that happen I think Project Row Houses was a great example of that so uh, thank you guys uh, for those answers and thank you for that question. Um, so our next question is, uh, hold on, making sure I'm not skipping anyone in the chat. Okay, awesome. Um, so our next question is from Shimoya. Um, for those of you who have used text in your posters, please share your approach of how you brought them together with the images in your work. Do you start with text or the image? That's a great question. I can um, sort of speak up on this and also address Jennifer's question um, further down the chat. Um, but I actually started, so the image that I created was a, uh, an American flag stripped of the red stripes and put directly onto a, a wall. And it's actually based off of uh, an actual flag that I made that will be um, included in my thesis show. And so I took an image of that and started playing around with it and, and looking at what the form represented. And um, originally it was supposed to be actually a small woodblock print that I was going to make. And so the text sort of followed based on this, um, it's uh, what's called an ex libris, which is out of the library of, that you would find in books um, that, um, book owners would put in their books. And so I sort of expanded that idea to the poster. And one of the things about um, the flag was a lot of my work comes from uh, improvisation and responses to what I see in the making process. And so one of the things that I learned when I put that flag on the wall was that the shape um, was very referential to a, a Klansman's hood. And so this shape sort of emerged and became uh, this sort of undercurrent in the piece itself, um, which is a meaning that was one frightening to me as um, any Klansman's hood is to anybody who is respective of um, American history, um, but also something that I was intrigued by because it added a new layer to the, to the work itself. And so this phrase that I wrote, Ex Americus, became really about, um, really became about imagining where that past was and the future that we're going in. And so are we taking this past with us or are we recreating something new? Or are we, um, are we spending our energies uh, fighting that past or are we carrying on step by step into the future together? Um, so these are sort of the things that I was creating. And I, I think that that answered your question, Jennifer, but if you have anything else to ask, I'm, I'm definitely willing to answer it. I've got a quick thing on that. Um, so, um, so my image was text. Um, and, um, and, but like a lot of what the project for me was, um, was this shift in uh, the modality or the platform that I was 
uh, playing with. And so the text comes from a personal note on an index card that the, order, that the artist Gordon Mata Clark had written. And this was a way he used his index cards as a way to play around with language and and um and um so it was it was never meant to be like a finished work in a gallery per se but uh these these index cards are really amazing and um they're part of his archive and so i discovered them when i was looking into his work and i i um um i kind of fell in love with his index cards and um so um, I was already um, doing some works where I was transcribing or, or um, reinterpreting um, uh, like archival documents on uh, through like a scale shift. And so I was drawing things that other people had made. And um, so I saw this as, a, as an opportunity to take this index card and to turn it into a drawing and then turn the drawing into a poster. So there's these shifts where it goes from something very personal um, to something that the public can engage with. Um, and just looking into Gordon Mata Clark's work, um, uh, he, he really played around with uh, metaphor and allegory quite a bit. And so I believe that when he had written this, that he was thinking about taking down structures like beyond just physical structures. And so I was kind of giving voice to, to that um, and um, gi giving people an opportunity to engage with, because uh, basically it's directions on how to take down a physical structure. You cut between the supports and it collapses. And so I was thinking about it as an allegory for taking down um, socio-political structures of injustice. Um, and so it's simple instructions on how to take something down. And um, so I just found it an, an, a really great opportunity to, to shift um, from, from index card to drawing to poster so that the public can see it and so it, it provided a great vehicle for that so um and then i would say maybe including possibly like audio works um may uh and and something like this in the future and anyways it was i'm glad to have taken part thanks Awesome, thank you guys so much for your answers. Um, so our next question is for Jenna. Um, are the colors you are using red and blue, um, oh, excuse me, let me just start over. Are the colors you are using red and blue important to your concept? What made you think of using a phone alert? Um, so the colors I used weren't necessarily that important. I just wanted something that had contrast and that would pop kind of like a um, pop art poster almost. Um, and then for the phone alert, I was thinking a lot about social media because um, like over the summer, Instagram stories and like the Blackout Tuesday, um, things like that were blowing up. And then I was starting to notice on my Facebook I had some like old friends from high school and I come from like a very small town that's not very diverse and some people were posting about how they were like wanting things to go back to quote normal and um, so my piece was kind of a reaction to that and obviously I unfriended those people because I disagree with what they were saying but that was where the um, phone alert came from. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and uh, for, forgive me if I'm wrong, but uh, Jennifer, are we coming up on time or do, do we still want to take more questions? We're almost at time. I know we just have two minutes. Should we? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, uh, well, I was actually going to say, um, well, um, I, I, I also 
You, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think that it's discussions like this and, um, and, and, and opportunities like this that will help alleviate some of that pressure on our social injustice. But um, it, 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 you, you know, I think we, it, it makes us think about how, how does it go beyond this? Uh, how does it go beyond uh, just our discussion, just our thoughts, just our reactions? Um, and, um, uh, and, and I think that goes back to the title uh, of the exhibition where, uh, where we're, we're, we're resisting, but we're also um, responding, but how are we rethinking? How, what critical work are we doing after we resist and respond to uh, uh, the things that are occurring in our society? Uh, and how are we restructuring that? Not only just as artists, not only just as students uh, or staff members, the faculty at the university, but just uh, in our everyday life. And in and, and, and what ways are we fighting and combating those forces? And, uh, and understanding it too. Uh, and I think it goes beyond just this idea that this, there's a bad side to it and that bad side needs to be eradicated. No, it needs to be brought to light. It needs to be understood, it needs to be acknowledged. And I think that that's important too, is that we don't cover up our work with all the good things we're doing. Like, oh, we have an initiative going. So that, therefore we're fixing the problem. No, we're acknowledging the problem too. We're being very open and discursive about how these problems are still uh, occurring even when we implement something to solve it there are more problems that may uh, arise around that just because that's just how deeply ingrained the system is uh, I want to say damaged so um, I just want to thank everyone for sharing their their time with us and uh, just talking and engaging with us on this panel discussion today um, and I'll hand it over to Jennifer Oops. Oh, hello. <laughs> Am I back on? I froze for a second. Oh, oh, so okay. All right. No, no, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Wow. What an ending. I know. I, I don't want to say too much after that because that was like a brilliant way, a lovely way to end our conversation today. Thank you to all of the artists. Wow. It was, yeah, really amazing to hear from all of you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. That was, um, I learned, yeah, so much today. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, just to let you know, Stamps Gallery's next event um, is being held in partnership with UMA, and that is a virtual panel discussion for our exhibition, Get Out the Vote, Empowering the Women's Vote. Um, that event is taking place on Thursday, October 29th from noon to 1.30. Panelists will include Stamps School of Art and Design professors, Audrey Bennett and Hany Hannah Smotrich. Um, who each have a poster in the show, as well as Michigan State um, Professor Kelly Selchel MacArthur. Um, those panelists will be joined by UM Museum of Art Student Engagement Council members, Emily Considine and Sarah Jacob. Um, all will share ideas, uh, their ideas about the intersection of art design and activism. And we'll also have a Q&A following that event. So um, yeah, I hope you can join for that. And uh, thank you so much uh, for coming today. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. That was fantastic. No problem. Hey, there's Frank. You, hey, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. Eddie, I love your outfit and your background. It's just like, it's so perfect. <laughs> Oh, it was so you. perfect for hosting. <laughs> thanks. I was figuring, um, I was trying to figure out how to be more inviting over Zoom. And uh, besides, you know, putting on clothes, I was like, well, I want to have a nice background going. And, um, oh, you nailed it. Yeah, it's my favorite color, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. And that was really great. Hello, Frank. And uh, <clears throat> it's very nice to meet you virtually. And welcome to Stamps. You did a very good job. Thank you. Um, I, I was I was very honored to um, be to moderate. I was um, I was definitely looking at my questions and thinking about how I wanted to engage in the conversation, and then realized I was already implementing microaggressions on myself. Of oh, is that a sensitive question? I was like, no, there is no sensitive question. These this this has to be discussed. And I think that. I really just appreciate how uh, the artists uh, were really engaging in that regard. And um, 
you know, they, I feel like they're in a place now where they understand that as artists, they do have a responsibility. So like, they're going to get asked challenging questions about their work. Um, and it was just, it was really great. This is really great, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, Eddie, I wanted to say, um, especially with uh, things that came up, like it would be really great. You know, we will do some, fee um, you know, surveys and get feedback, but it would be great to think about, and if there's interest to see about how we can continue these conversations, um, you know, beyond, uh, you know, at a programmatic level. I mean, of course, you know, we want the exhibition to continue next year, um, you know, sort of annually, but it would, if, you know, and if you're interested, it'd be great to sort of, um, yeah, continue kind of working with you on this too, um, you know. Yeah, I would love to. I, um, yeah, I was just thinking how uh, at the end of this, I was like, I would love to do this again in whatever form. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yeah. Good. Well, you know, um, one of the first things I met Shuli was um, when she interviewed for the job and she talked about how she wanted to make the gallery into a, a classroom, a teaching space. And so for me, this is perfect, you know. I noticed that a couple of my students were in there and I just sent them an email. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to see them at 2 o'clock. But um, it was just terrific. Thank you so and, much. Uh, as you know, anything I can do, I'm happy to. It's from where I think we're seeing each other on Friday. Friday, yeah. Okay. Eddie, welcome, and uh, you guys, fantastic. Yay! Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, okay. Eddie. It really helped the show. So. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye, you guys. Bye.